now more than ever, we need to be thoughtful about how we design in-person spaces because if I thought there was a difference between people's intention around networking and their follow-through before the pandemic, we're, we're, we are so out of practice now. You're listening to episode 23 of the Happy Space podcast, and today we're exploring how to design events for rich connection with networking expert, Robbie Samuels. Welcome to the Happy Space Podcast, where productivity meets inclusivity, and everyone gets things done. Hello, I'm Claire Kumar, highly sensitive executive coach, speaker, and your host. Studies show that diversity leads to better business outcomes. So doesn't it make sense to invite everyone's richest contribution? Yet too many people are invited to burn out or opt out, and we are squandering talent. On this show, we'll explore a two-part solution. Part one, cultivating sustainable performance, the individual design of work and life to preserve our energy so we can keep contributing. And two, designing inclusive performance, the design of spaces, cultures, products, and services which invite the richest participation. I hope you enjoy these conversations and find inspiration and encouragement for everyone deserves a happy space. This is going to be a little unorthodox start because I want to introduce you to Ellie, who I have tried to relocate. He's purring incredibly loudly. I hope it's not going to break through and be disturbing, but he is uh, determined to be here for this intro. And I'm kind of glad he is because he was here for most of the interview itself as well. You know, for some of us, um, Zoom has gone from savior and social glue in March of 2020, when it really held us together, to now with countless tedious hours spent looking at little black squares with no face, and maybe if you're lucky, a name and where somebody's from, to being almost a virtual Satan for us. Enter now, just in the nick of time, Robbie Samuel's book. It's called Break Out of Boredom low-tech solutions for highly engaging Zoom events. Now, Robbie is a networking enthusiast and has really built a career following this thread of really thinking about how to invite people to perform and welcome them and make them feel safe. So Robbie had me at low-tech, but what really drew me to this book is that everything that Robbie does is his evidence of his naturally inclusive spirit and chronic generosity. You will absolutely get ideas of what I'm talking about in this interview. The point of this podcast, as you know, is to celebrate the design of inclusive performance. And I can think of no one who thinks about it so intuitively, this welcoming of people and making them feel safe and comfortable the way Robbie does. So I want you to think of this book as not only a guide to Zoom events, but way beyond that to small things you can do that will have big impact, I call them little big things, in creating a culture where people feel safe and comfortable enough to contribute. I know that is a hot topic leadership issue right now. How do we start to foster this culture when we're dispersed? Well, Robbie has all the answers, I can tell you. Robbie has been recognized as a networking expert by NPR, Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and Inc. He's an, uh, been noted as an expert in virtual event designed by JDC Events. His three books have, collective, have collectively received over 600 five-star reviews, a couple of them being mine. And I wouldn't be surprised if his fourth book is not just how to effectively launch a book, of which uh, he, could, he could definitely tell you all you need to know about how to successfully launch but it's the bigger topic of how to effectively engage your fans, not only to help build your business, but to support your charity of choice. It's that continuous chronic generosity that I was talking about. Since 2016, Robbie has hosted the On the Schmooze podcast. I think it's over well over 300 episodes now. And since March 2020, after having an idea, I think on a Thursday evening, the next Friday, he started the very first no More Bad Zoo, Virtual Happy Hour. I hope you'll enjoy this conversation with uh, Robbie as much as I did. 
He's just a treat to have in my world, and I'm happy to share him with you today. Robbie Samuels, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm excited for listeners to hear from you on so many things, but I want to start with the fact that ever since I met you, what struck me about you was your incredible, calming, warm, inviting energy. And I'm pretty sure we met first in a Zoom room. And uh, your your warmth and grace infuses everything you do. And I want you to share with us, where does that come from? Mm. You know, I got asked years ago um, to write an opening welcome series, you know, like as a business owner, it's a thing you do. And I felt really challenged by this project because they say, you know, write about how you've always had trouble with X and then you figured out why and now you can do Z, you know. And I was like, I've never been the shy introvert wallflower, but I keep attracting all these people and I've never been, well, an entrepreneurial woman in my fifties, I'm getting close to my fifties, but the, you know, so like, what is it that I'm doing? Like, how do I explain this? And I'll answer you with what I came up with. And I had someone call me to walk me through this. When I was a kid, I went to day camp and I somehow just didn't really jive with my fellow campers. You know, like eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, particularly I remember like the 11, 12, I was hanging out with the counselors. I made friends with the office staff. I made friends with the kitchen staff. So one summer, I'm 12 years old. I'm not old enough to be a counselor in training. You have to be 13. I spent so much time doing non-camper activities that they wanted me to stay on longer. I wanted to stay on longer. My parents said, yes, but we're not paying for it. I ran the arts like, you know, shack when the teacher disappeared for two weeks. They only realized it was happening because I asked for more supplies. I ran, you know, messages to the front office. So there was something about how I was showing up where the adults were all interacting with me fine. But I remember walking up to some peers. So there's campers standing in a circle. Now, my camper self thinks they saw me and they were avoiding me. My adult self realizes they probably didn't even know I was there, but their body language was, well, we all can picture it, right? You're going into an event, people are standing in those tight clusters, those shoulder to shoulder huddles, possible to break into. And you're like winding around the outside, hoping someone's gonna let you in, catch your eye. So there was something about me that I didn't know what it was. And I, I wasn't terribly worried about it either. I was finding other ways to thrive. I learned how, for instance, to cut a watermelon. Do you know what I mean? I know I knew how the bug juice was made. I mean, I just knew stuff as a 12 year old. I was setting up the Commodore 64s for the computer lab. Like I was doing fine, but getting all of my peers, I wasn't quite getting. Now, years go by before I realize I'm queer. And then I years later figure out I'm, I'm actually trans. And like, I didn't, this, these are core identity pieces that again, we're not front and center. I, I can't say that I struggled my whole life with it. I didn't because I found other ways to show up and be appreciated. But that feeling of difference, of being othered, of not fitting in, of wondering whether you belong and thinking people are talking about you when you're probably not the topic of conversation, even though I am an outgoing extrovert who you know thrives in a lot of spaces that will make other people miserable, and even though I'm malpresenting and have all the male privileges afforded with that, I still get that. I get what it's like to feel like other. And that sometimes the thing we feel othered about is not visible, that it's not always something that we can say, oh, look, we have, uh, we have two of those people in the room. Therefore, we have achieved diversity. They're fine. That, it, that sometimes the thing that those people are looking for is something that is not as visible and they're not able to find it there for. So I just feel like I have a sensitivity that there's a difference between inviting and welcoming. And I am guilty of doing the former a lot. My 20s were all about running groups that we were inviting, 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 and then talking about how, how do we get these people to, and the, the, these people, young people, old people, people of color in a prevalently white space, whatever it was, right? 
you know what, if you, if you teach all of your regulars to create a welcoming space, the people who truly need it, the demographic outliers are going to be welcomed. And that, that started me on this journey. So I started designing in-person events that really fostered a, a community connection. Mm-hmm. And in the first five feet of the event, you met four or five people mm-hmm. intentionally. And you walked away from those five feet, having a name tag on, you paid your door fee, you had an icebreaker bingo sheet and a pen. One of the squares was already filled out. You had an asking about tag on and I'm looking for a tag on and someone pointed you in the direction of the bar. You, so you felt like you belonged immediately. Immediately. Right? Yeah, immediately. I went to an Everybody. event. I went to an event. Uh, I don't know, it must be, must be easily three years ago now, right? right. <laughs> when, when there were events. And I met somebody, a fellow speaker at the event. And she came up and she said, oh, you must know everybody here. Like, no, later on, she told me I made her feel so welcome. I was new there too. I had no idea. So there's, I, I, I had never thought of it until you mentioned it now, this different difference between being invited and feeling welcome. Can you expand on that like a, a little bit? What, what's the difference? And what's okay, the so, there? so picture, um, I, I'm, I'm going to use a black woman as the example, because I think there are a lot of organizations that purport to want to add this diversity to their their ranks, but they do it in like in ways that just feel I mean, diversity is a metric, right? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about inclusion. We're talking about belonging. Mm -hmm. So if this black woman walks in the room, signs in, circles the room, no one talks to her. She might leave. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have a conversation as this as the team organizing the event saying, well, how do we get more people like that, quote unquote, that, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever the, that is, in this case, Black women. How do we get more Black women to attend? And I think the question should be, how do we get more people to stay? Mm-hmm. It's always easier and less expensive to retain membership than to find new members. So one of the things I ended up doing was working with organizations to help them design these events that were really about including and retaining membership. And now I'm doing it more virtually. But the, the essence is still the same. People go to events for a mixture of content and connection, right? And if they're not finding the connection, they don't really need to go to your event. Like they can find the content elsewhere. I mean, they could stay home even before the pandemic. Yep. You know, we, by the way, books are really old. We've had access to knowledge for a long time, but we have the internet, we have podcasts, we have, you know, web webinars and webcasts. We, we just, we have a lot of ways to learn people make the effort to leave their home and travel in order to find their people. Mm-hmm. And then when virtual became synonymous with events, I needed to figure out a way to make virtual not an exception to the rule that events are by content connection. So my approach to, to Zoom and virtual platforms <clears throat> really stems from this quandary I was in in May, March, April, May of 2020. How am I going to achieve these results and get this sort of promise met in a virtual space. Today's episode of the Happy Space podcast is sponsored by ClaireKumar.com. With sensitivity, curiosity, and courage, I serve three groups asking the tough questions that lead to meaningful answers. Number one, I coach ambitious leaders to design for well-being and achieve next level work-life integration. Number two, I mic drop thought bombs, that's bombs as in B-A-L-M-S, in keynotes and workshops, helping organizations achieve the business imperative that is inclusivity. And three, I collaborate with brands concerned with respect for well-being on product design, marketing, and PR. If any of this piqued your interest, come find me at clairekumar.com. I'd love to speak with you. Designing inclusive performance together will lead to the richest results. And so my most recent book is The Answers uh, that I figured out in the last three years. Okay, I'm so excited to talk about all of it. Let's, because you brought it up, let's talk about the most recent book. But I do want to go back to the first book as well. And we can even talk about the book in the middle if you want. But let's start with the most recent one. Well, you know, I actually will tell you them in order if that's okay. Because I think they do build on each other. So, um before the pandemic, I spent over a decade working to be recognized as a networking expert. And half that time I was employed organizing fundraising events. And I was also running this group, which is a meetup group called Socializing for Justice. We ran 
I'm easily 25 events a year for my job and 24 events a year for my meetup. And then I was voluntarily putting together um, unconferences for fun. Um, so I was really in the event space. So but hang on a I, second. Just just elaborate on unconference. Just for listeners who are like, really what's cool he model. talking about? <laughs> yeah, I debated whether to say the word because I knew that would be a question. All right. Unconference is an awesome model where you decide everything logistically except for the content. And right. everyone gets to that morning and they write down a piece of paper what topics they would like to have, they would like to share and speak about mm. or facilitate. And then we do a process to figure out which ones go up on the board. Yeah. And so creating it. It's co create. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I ran that twice where we would pull together a team of volunteers 10 weeks before the event. And then the 10, the 10 weeks we planned. I mean, the first time we didn't have a location. So, um, so I have a lot of experience about, I mean, I think that the, in some ways, the process of running the event was as much the experience as the event itself. In, it sounds fun to me. It's, 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 uh, suits my need for novel stimulation. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. So okay. I, Thank so you. I leave my day job. I go full-time into entrepreneurship in 2015. I mm -hmm. subsequently launch a podcast on the schmooze, which I'm still hosting all these years later. My first book comes out, Croissants versus Bagels, Strategic, Effective, and Inclusive Networking at Conferences, because I am working to be recognized as a networking expert with a focus on networking at conferences. I do a group coaching program. I write for Harvard Business Review about networking, and I do a TEDx talk, which was Hate Networking, Stop Bageling, and Be the Croissant, which featured my most sort of memorable and sticky concept around networking, which was about body language. So that that video for TEDx came out January of 2020. And in a lot of ways, I was going to be an overnight success 10 years in the making. Yeah. And then two months later, nobody needed any of the skills or accolades that I had acquired in the previous 10 plus years. I need to find a new way to show up and offer value. So I ended up actually meeting with my mastermind and they kicked me in the pants. <laughs> Uh, and remind me that for me, networking wasn't about in person. I had built a fifth, uh, like a global network over five years. So they said, go help people do that. So I wrote nine ways to network in a pandemic as a blog post, you know, email type thing. And I shared it on uh, March 12th. And I looked at it that night. And number three was host a virtual happy hour. So I on went your own to Dor list. on my own list. <laughs> and I went to Dory Clark's community, mm -hmm. which I was been a member of for years at that point. And I said, hey, if I host something tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern, would anyone come? And I got a couple of quick responses. I mean, I didn't come up with the idea until 8 o'clock at night on a Thursday. So I didn't do market research to come up with the time and day. It was literally the next time on my calendar that seemed like a reasonable time to have a quote-unquote happy hour. I ran that Friday event for two years weekly. A month in, it became known as the No More Bad Zoom virtual happy hour. It had had, you know, nomorebadzoom.com. I got the URL. I also, that same day, mid-April, bought 5percentadvantage.com, which was this pilot I was going to launch in May about how to design um, events and how to become more confident and confident using Zoom. Mind you, March 13th, I didn't know I had access to breakout rooms, just to give context. Right. <laughs> so yeah. 15 people signed up for the program, $500 a piece. It's a four-week program. I ran it four months in a row. The third month, it becomes a certification program. And by the summer, organizations were reaching out. By the fall, I had a docket of event clients who were looking to help me have, I was helping them bring their events online with less stress and greater participant engagement. Now, I wrote about that journey in my second book because at the time I was also, um, I was coaching about a dozen entrepreneurs a week on behalf of this company. And then they asked me to take on this cohort of 120 students going through an online course about how to launch an online course, which is very meta. And I said, yes, because my business had sort of disappeared, right? Like in-person was gone. Mm -hmm. That ended up being a very full-time role. And I had so much data. People, you know, I was meeting with so many people, plus all my network who were picking my brain. Yes. Robbie helped me with this. Robbie, you seem to know something about Zoom, right? So suddenly I was just busy and I turned those conversations into research calls because as a coach, I would never tell a client to just fill your calendar with like social calls, right? Like my extrovert self would have been happy to just have social calls because I mean, the idea of talking to people I wasn't in charge of feeding was in itself just really exciting. <laughs>
So I had yeah. quick success. And by November 2020, I had a thriving six figure business. And my second book, Small List, Big Results, launched a successful offer, no matter the size your email list addresses the process that I did and like basically what I was working on with all these coaching clients. So fast forward, we're now three years from the pandemic and I've come out with a new book. What happened was a year ago, a traditional publisher reached out to me about writing a book on Zoom. And after four months of discussing things, it turned out they wanted me to write it about Zoom in the workplace. And I don't know that. That's not my place. I don't do that. But I basically have an assistant who's like, you already wrote the book. All the materials are already here. You are the videos. We already have transcripts. So shout out to Paya for helping me commit to this. So June of last year, I committed. Last fall, I started working on it. It ended up being a much bigger book because breakout rooms, for example, are such an amazing possibility that we all squander. Mm. So that ended up being 10,000 words of a 64,000 word book. And it was like the first section that I really jumped into. And so I thought it was going to be like, you know, half or less that size, this book. <laughs> um, but it, the book came out and it, and, it, and it came out on the anniversary of March 13th, 2023. Mm. Well, y- there is a beautiful story. Yes. And, and what I love, because I, I know you and I'm, I'm, I hear about your business a lot, is your initial work, you know, that 10 years is still a, a, a fruitful mine. It's, it's people are coming back to you for this essentially timeless concert, con, uh, content now that we're actually getting back together again and we're going to have both. Well, the interesting thing is that that TEDx that went, you know, to the scrap floor, the, you know, with the cutting room floor, right, is a scrap in the fall, in se- late September, October of, of last year, 2022, NPR came across it and asked to interview me about the content of my first book and my TEDx talk. Yeah. Which was wild because it was, you know, I was so removed by then. Yeah. But you're right. Like, it is timeless. And now more than ever, we need to be thoughtful about how we design in-person spaces because if I thought there was a difference between people's intention around networking and their follow through before the pandemic, we're, we're, we are so out of practice now. There was a study years ago by the International Association of Exhibitions and Events that found that 76% of the per- people they surveyed said that networking was a top driver for why they attend an event. Mm-hmm. But you and me, we can't think that 76% of the people attending events leave having made the, the even three of the perfect connections, Mm -hmm. even three, Mm -hmm. because either they're hanging out with people they already know, they're hanging out in their room, they're hanging out in the front row, not talking to anyone, they're skipping the networking. And the organizers think, we'll just have more networking hours because that's what people are asking for. But unstructured networking doesn't really cut it. So I actually do work now again with in-person and I have all these small minor micro adjustments even th- mm-hmm. that the speaker and hosts and volunteers can do before and after the session mm-hmm. that help people find each other. And then there, are, of course, is like, how do you design a session itself to be more engaging? But I just think there's so many missed opportunities for when people, you know, the vibrant chaotic hallway that not everyone loves, right? So you duck into the next session and you sit as far as you can from everyone else and get on your phone. But those are the people who actually, those are your people. They also like came to the same session, came early, ducked out of the hallway. Like even if you met one of those other people, yeah, it's, it's a more likely connection than like meeting people at the Starbucks, right? In the hotel lobby. Yeah. So I work on helping people with those sort of be more thoughtful about that. So don't leave people to their own devices. They will, they will kind of shrink and just do their own thing and they won't, they'll miss the opportunity that you're laying out for them. But maybe not welcome them. Welcome. Yeah. It's a, it's a subtle thing. My wife's a shy, um, extrovert, which means she likes being around people, but you wouldn't really know she was there. And she happens to also be a great host. So if she was walked into a room and there was a table tent that said, here's the question that you all can chat about before the session begins, she would more likely than not say, Oh, um, Hey, there's this, uh, there's this question here. What do you, what do y'all think of this? And she, she would jump, she would like, welcome people to the table like she would jump into that role if she was just given even a little nudge in that direction 
Mm. You know what I've liked at a party is like, oh, there's food. Let me take the food around. <laughs> Gives me something to do. And yeah, giving yourself and, a role. And exactly, exactly. I feel so at home then. So I'm like, how about you go meet people with the food? <laughs> you know? I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so much wisdom in there. I'm I'm sure people are like croissant versus bagel and coming right back to that. Yeah, do we gotta come back to that. Yeah, do you want to just that. explain that? Because okay, so I, I, I mean, you could earlier. just be thinking about croissants and be happy because of all the butter involved. Or yes, yes, right. But maybe uh, you want to share that because so that's when I first met you was there, um, and seeing you talk about that on stage. Actually, oh, in Toronto. Yes, that's where I first met you, and I was like, oh, gosh, that's a great idea. And I've done that ever since I've been in a networking group. Physical, I reposition myself croissant like. All right. So we should, yeah. we have to talk about the concept. And I also want to talk about that day. I'll just say that we were at an event with professional speakers that I did not know many people. And I thought the people, the names that I knew in the room, I looked up to, I didn't think they knew me for a hole in the wall, but I thought, wow, I'm with a really good cool group of speakers. This is awesome. Oh my gosh. Probably everyone's feeling that, but I was definitely feeling that. And I got invited to come up on stage and share this tip. Yeah. And it was a rare thing that the host actually left the stage and he left his wife who normally is never on stage by herself to sit with me. And like, I don't think they'd ever done that before. It was like yeah. a big deal. So here's the concept. We talked earlier about how I was approaching those campers and they were in that tight little cluster. That cluster, everyone's visualizing their own cluster. That's the bagel, right? Because it's impossible to break into. But if one person in that circle shifts their body language to open, then that's the croissant. So people will kind of naturally stand certain ways, but if you walk in a room, if you kind of scan how groups are standing, you might see some natural openings and those are just gonna be easier to break into than the really shoulder to shoulder huddles. And if you're in a space and you're in that circle, what can you do to remember like you're there to meet people? How can you position your body language? Even one-on-one, -on -one, how can you position your body language? Now, sometimes you want to only have like the attention of that one person for a moment, but the default seems to be to always be closed, but you're at, you left your house, you put on hard pants and real shoes. Come on, hard pants. That's something I learned recently from women. Right. Cracks me up. Um, yeah. So, so uh, I think just, you know, it's, it's a mindset shift, but it's, it's so funny, like a small percentage of the room having that awareness can really open things up. And I've met people who are wheelchair users and I will say it actually helps them as well. I know we're talking about a standing thing, but yeah. for them, it is, a, it is literally about shifting their chair to be more or less open or closed. It is, again, it's a body language. So for them, the extension of that would be the, the chair. Mm -hmm. So I know we're talking about standing, but honestly, it's just, again, it's a mindset of like, how do I include people in this conversation or am I not? And it's, uh, it's very sticky. People years later point to their feet and tell me, look, look, croissant, croissant. And my yeah. TEDx, you can share the link to this, robbysamuels.com forward slash TEDx. Mm -hmm. I had people come up on stage with me to actually demonstrate this. I broke all the rules. I set out of the circle. I, I brought people it. up on stage. Yeah. It's the Robbie show. We're going to do it. Well, we do it it's, ourselves, yeah. Well, and it's, it's like I said, I saw it. I was Oh, this is so simple. And, and yeah. So what I think you are, one of your great skills is noticing these, I call them little big things, right? It's a little thing, but oh, the impact is monumental and life-changing really. Someone I mean, called I, them yeah. small, big ideas yeah. because they were, they were little ideas, but when put into place, they like had big implications. That's right. Exactly. So they're little, little things, little tweaks. Yeah. You know, like in person, we know the order that people are going to go around the room because it's evident, but online, that's not clear. So I always do an on deck so yeah. that people know who's coming up next. So they're not cut off guard. So they know to unmute. So they're prepared. So they know to listen to what the yeah. previous person do. Yeah. It's I gave subtle a little things. Yeah. I gave a talk this morning on understanding and embracing neurodiversity. And one of the things that I talked about was our need for clear wayfinding. And smooth transitions. And mm -hmm. so you you do that with the queuing, right? You know, so mm -hmm. so and so is on deck or so and so is up, and then you're ready next, Barbara, or whatever, right? right. So it's this sense of 
I can be ready. I'm not startled. I feel safe. I feel safe. I feel safe. I can you know, speak. I didn't know I had this skill. March 13th, I host this, this event and I had been trained to do masterminds virtually. Mm -hmm. So I actually had some virtual, some training for, for virtual facilitation, mm -hmm. but I, I at that point wasn't giving it a lot of weight or yeah. importance. You know, I, I didn't realize that it was a skill. And when we sat around, it was pretty casual. It was 20 of us, yeah. but no one was caught off guard. Everyone knew who was going to go. I didn't say like, wait, wait, who went last? I lost track. I didn't do any of that, which, you, you know, we then spent months living through that. And people were like, wow. <laughs> and I thought, oh, but the bar is so low, you know, like you don't, but then it <laughs> turned out like that was a really basic thing. Yeah. And I now believe that structure is a feature of belonging that the lack of structure when speakers abstain from structure. Um, I, I was on a call recently at a, where um, the, the host just kept saying I was producing. Um, so if anyone else has anything to say, just go ahead, go ahead on mute. I mean, would you do that in person? Yeah. Like go ahead and start talking. Oh, so for the blurts, the people that blurt like me, <laughs> but like as a, but no. but you wouldn't be invited to, but like, no. you know, it would be okay. Now it's time for questions or comments. Could you, and it'll either be queue up at the microphone, raise your hand, hand an index card. Yeah. You know, it'll Absolutely. be some, some cue. So structure, giving people a, here's the agenda. Here's mm -hmm. when the breaks are keeping to the breaks. Here's how to ask questions. Here's how we're going to address questions. Mm. These are wayfinding, like you said. Yeah. And then, you know, because you witnessed me do this in a training, I have these two slides that I'm now, I'm so happy to, so my community helped me come up with the realization that this was part of it. But one, I call a pause slide, yes. which has got a little pause button and it says, jot down your takeaways and put your questions in chat. So they yeah. take away this for themselves and in mm. person. They'd be writing their takeaways and their questions in their own notes so that they were prepared for the Q&A later. Mm -hmm. And then the next slide after I pause and I, I, I basically let them do that and I take a drink and I look through the things happening in chat, gives me a breath. I address anything that's urgent, any clarification questions. Mostly I hold things till later. Next slide, it's the agenda again, but there is a different color for the upcoming topic. So, you know, it's like a train. So you know station. where you are. Yeah. Here's where we're going next. We've done yeah. all that. Now we're going here. I've heard from people who are dealing with traumatic brain injury, uh, neurodiversity, ADHD, yeah. autism, highly sensitive, just people who are easily distracted for any number of reasons, life, kids, dogs, pets, you know, mm -hmm. who are like, oh, well, that's nice. And the pause, this is very interesting for virtual. Yeah. We never pause on virtual, right? It, like we, if we, we pause, as speakers, it's awkward, right? right? But it's yeah. powerful. Because it gets everyone's attention because they think they lost their internet. So they <laughs> you're snap to and if attention. you don't move, you froze. <laughs> so they snap to attention when I get to that thing. I go, okay, folks, this is your chance. To... And then I just stop talking for a moment. And like everyone, I think, has a jolt of. And then I go, and now here we are. This is where we're going next. And it's a, it's funny. Like you can yell into a microphone to get attention, or you could be super quiet to get attention. Yes. Yeah, it's a little circuit interrupt from what our expectation is. And we notice yeah. that. So we're like, it's, yeah, especially because the internet sometimes is kind to us and some, sometimes is not. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. I remember uh, really appreciating the pro pause. I, I, it's something I invite my clients to do in their day. But as a speaker, I've always thought I'm leading this thing. I got to just keep delivering value. I got to keep just pumping stuff out. Right. And oh, what a gift it is to invite everybody to catch a breath. My, my uh, invitation to the, or the welcome card landing page to the zoom room is, is basically, you know, you, you're in a waiting room and it's like, here's a little chance to catch your breath. I'll be right yeah. with you, you know? And it's yeah. just meant to feel like, Ooh, you just got a little, you just got a little exhale in your day. Which yeah. We all need a little bit of that. That's well, I'm a person who talks really fast, mm -hmm. right? I'm raised New Yorker, you know? And so I, and I love giving away knowledge. Like it's my jam. So yeah. I could just fill the hour and the pause. It helps me kind of reset. 
right? It, it's a reminder to me. And I also makes me think, well, how much content can I truly put in this? Mm-hmm. If I'm going to, you know, what are the key pieces? Like what's important? And so I just did this. I've now done the same presentation in a full hour, including Q&A. And I just did it for 90 minutes. And we took the full 90 minutes, same, right? same slides. It just said I allowed more, more pause, more Q&A, more storytelling. And so for the, for the 90 minutes, I often was turning off my slides and speaking right to the camera and telling a story and then advancing the slides behind the scene and bringing it up again. And now here's a tip about advancing the slides behind the scene. If you don't, which is fine, this is about getting 5% better. Our brains are automatically going to read what's on the screen and it's what they already read. And there's this moment of like, have I seen this before? Oh yeah. Oh, now with some information. Oh yeah. Now I'm going to read this. Yeah. And meanwhile, you're talking the whole time as a speaker and they're now having to cognitively do a lot of interpretation, which none of us notice, but it's all these subtle things and the cognitive load of being online at all. Plus we are surrounded by screens and temptation. So if these are little things we can do to help people who are processing maybe at a different pace, you know, right. advance the slide behind the scene, pause when you get to the slide for a moment and then speak to each point in the slide in yeah. case people aren't able to see it. And the, the reasons for not being able to see it could be any number of things from blind to driving their kids to school, right? Yeah. But speak yeah. to all the main points, describe my friend who's um, blind talked about how there was a presentation where the punchline was a visual oh. and she still to this day has no idea why everyone was laughing. That's not inclusive. Yeah. So we, as we all can think about inclusion yeah. and I have a whole section actually in my book, I memorized the page number because it's not in the table of contents. Oh. It was one of my, one of my concerns. I was upset about this. I had all these detailed subsections of the table of contents and I got huh. convinced that a nine page table of contents wasn't a good idea. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, but they could have gone like, so I, right. I did just like right. the, you know, the higher level topic and um, the section on accessibility and presentations, which is page 105 is within uh, the section on doing a lecture and doing creating content. But right. I, there's a lot to consider. And of course we only come at this from our own perspective. So we might be sensitive, like you would never design something with lots of movement and things flashing in. You, right? You've heard me on a call where I'm like, huh? I can't, yeah. I can't even watch because there were multiple gifts on a, you know, moving. And I'm even now I'm getting, um, there's a pod fest pod, just finished yesterday and every email they send out has a gif at the top. I have to move it off my screen so fast because I can feel my blood pressure rising. <laughs> it's like, right. I start, so I, that you're so really aware of, but then mm-hmm. there's something else that you wouldn't be aware of. And so yeah. I aim still to get 5% better every time I Zoom, whether it's speaking, hosting, or participating. Yeah. And yeah. And it benefits everybody. I mean, so listeners, um, you're getting an idea from all that Robbie said so far that uh, he's got a lot of wisdom and a lot of thoughtfulness. So definitely if you're planning an online event, I can speak personally to... Uh, Robbie hosting an event. Robbie hosted and designed, like we worked on the flow together of my podcast launch party for this very podcast. So he's watched this uh, grow into a show. And so I'm very happy to have you on here, Robbie. But just noticing your thoughtfulness, um, having music so that it's not dead air. I was, I gave a presentation this morning and the dead air at the beginning just felt uncomfortable. I wanted to fill it, but I was the guest speaker. So I felt like I would be overstepping the host if I was like, hey, y'all, how is everybody? Hey, Ben, nice for joining. And it, like, I just you wanted know, it's to fill so it. interesting for you to bring that up because mm. I think the, the how we welcome, right? We're talking about welcoming. Mm. I, I got invited in. Um, it was a parent's call for this group that we were on. And my wife and I joined on separate devices. The room was silent. They didn't even wave at us. They didn't acknowledge us. They didn't put anything in chat. And, and then finally he unmutes like two minutes in. Okay, we're going to wait another um, couple of minutes to see if anyone else is coming. I'm like, what, what a weird thing. Anyway, now music there I like because we're not speaking over it. The purpose is set a tone. I exactly. don't recommend any longer putting music every time you ask people to do an activity on their own. 
And I think this is a very common thing, like even in person, mm-hmm. okay, everyone journal, everyone create a list, you know, and I think analog meaning like paper and pen activities on zoom are pretty cool. Again, it's a, it's an unexpected thing, mm-hmm. but then because most people don't know how to modulate the volume of the music, which is a thing that people yeah. don't even know they play music and it's really loud. And then, you, you know, and I, I don't even want to hear it and I'm like I'm lowering it and now I'm like well I gotta have it loud enough that I can hear them when they unmute and start talking <laughs> yeah it's so personal though right I I had a writing retreat in December and I met uh, Leslie who I've worked with for she, we've known each other only through zoom for two years and then we finally met in person and had this wonderful four days writing together we learned she can write by the pool with the music going, I, even with my noise canceling headphones, could not get it quiet enough. So I asked them to turn it down. She could no longer write there. She was like, oh, that's it for me. And who knew, right? Such wildly different, you know, same objective. Right. Just could not function in the same space at all with this, you know. So I think she put her music on in her headphones, but I couldn't get it quiet enough. It was just... It's, uh, it's like and that's where struggle. universal design is so important because in this instance, she was able to design to her own specifications yeah. wearing headphones. Exactly. But the universal design was that the volume was low enough that you could enjoy the space too. Yeah. So we have to sort the, of recognize yeah. it's different than accessibility. Like ADA compliance here in the United States is about, you know, wheelchair access and that kind of thing. But it doesn't take into account that the wheelchair user might be the person who's interpreting in the front of the room or the speaker in the front of the room. Right. And it may be that there's no way to be in the front of the room using a wheelchair with the way that room is designed, but there's a couple right. of spaces in the back of the room, yeah. right? So like access- The wheelchair on stage, wait a minute. No, no, they're in the audience. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And the same thing, like uh, another way to think about this is if you go into a room and the chairs are all set up classroom style. Well, I read this great book years ago called Community, The Structure of Belonging by Peter Block. And he basically the premise from that that I took, which I can't say specifically the wording, but it was essentially don't use a space the way it was left the night before by the janitorial staff. Mm. That just because you walk in a room and it's set up with classroom style chairs, if you feel like something else would be better, you either request it in advance or you just do it yourself. You either ask for the round tables with a 10, 10 top or an eight top so that no one has to sit with their back to the stage, right? You decide those things in advance. Yes. Or maybe you just get in. Like I've always, when I would present in person, I would be rearranging the room into circles. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, no, or like my last room. Let's pack 40 people in a room with that's designed for 24. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like, what the heck? Not ideal. <laughs> How safe is that? I don't know. <laughs> so universal design is, is another interesting concept. I think just, you know, you're asking me, where does this all come from? I'm, I'm really curious about community building. And I feel like community building happens when people feel safe enough to bring more of their selves, more of their, their true selves into the, not, maybe not all, right. We always keep a little something to ourselves, to our family, but if we can bring more of ourselves into a space. We're more likely to, um, to find our people. Yeah. And, and you know, we talk about, um, psychological safety a lot, but we haven't talked about neurological safety. Mm-hmm. And this is something I really encourage. And I think you actually intuitively think about how someone feels in the situation, physically, emotionally, all of it. And you create that safety that the nervous system can relax the pauses, the, you know, the wayfinding, all of that. It's, it's not really well talked about. It's starting to be Google has a great initiative on designing events um, for neuroinclusivity K Sargent episode two, talking about neuroinclusive design. I'm very excited to see more places understand this so that we can have more people participating and contributing and, and, and feeling connected. A hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. And I, I'm always excited to discover there are people doing this work. When I read that book by Peter Block, Community Mm. and Structure Belonging, I was in a plane on the way to a conference and it was, it was the work that I had been doing, but I didn't know that it was out there. I didn't know there was a whole body of work Mm -hmm. and community of people. I was by myself on a plane. I was so excited. I was about to like elbow the person next to me to be like, look at this thing. So <clears throat> I just remember that big moment. And when you just said that piece just now about neurodiversity sort of safety and neurological safety, um, again, I haven't been using those terms, but to me, 
you know, thinking about belonging, connection, relate, true relationship building, not transactional networking. Mm -hmm. This, this is all these pieces. I've, I've tried to break down to the components of yes. what the objectives are, you know, and then just, if you, it's, it's like, if you, even if you don't really understand it, if you can just follow a few basic tenets and then kind of build from there, yeah. you know, one is the question, whether you even need to meet and <laughs> then if you need to meet, yes. you know, people come in feeling, thinking, or, and are doing one thing. And yes. at the end of your time together, they're going to be thinking, feeling, and are doing another thing. And the in-between is a transformation. So what are those objectives? And then every design question is, will it help people achieve those objectives? That's purpose first design, which mm -hmm. applies to in-person and all virtual programming, any mm -hmm. meeting you're ever going to have. Yeah. So just really understanding those basic concepts and getting you and your team clear on that. It, I mean, it changes the question of whether or not to have music at this point, not just because you know how to do it suddenly, but because it actually serves a purpose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been saying to leaders in workshops, you know, we need exactly what you say, content, and we need connection, and they need to be fused together in everything that we're doing. I've been asking leaders, how much do you think about the connection piece? It's, we're so task focused, hustle, just knock it off. In fact, I'm kind of annoyed. I have to, I, I think I did reach out, Ron Friedman, who I interviewed before on the other podcast, um, he wrote Decoding Greatness, and he does a lot of productivity stuff. He shared research from his organization. I think it's Ignite 80. And he said that the, that the high performing teams actually do not spend time crafting the email and looking at emotional tone. And the high performing teams just like knock off communications and get shit done. My bad word. Um, I'm like, dude, at what cost? At what casualties? What are like, I don't know. Like it, it hurt me so much to read that that was the outcome of the, the research because I have so many questions of things that probably weren't measured. Like burnout? Like, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, the emotional exhaustion? Most of, exhaustion. Ugh, yeah. I mean, I know people who are on uh, wellness leave for, for racial stress. You know, I, I believe like, it. Oh my God. Oh my God. I'm, I'm just saying like, yeah, the, these, the, the like, we don't care. We're just going to throw things out there has an impact and well, the people that, who deal with it. the impact aren't the people who yeah. design the system like the people who design a system it works for them yeah. but somebody is getting the impact and if they can't find a way to live with that impact which they probably do in some way all the time they move on there's a cost i say we pay tax all day we pay tax in different ways and mm -hmm. the more we can design these experiences that feel good the less tax we're paying. Right? It doesn't cost a lot either. It's both, yeah. not, it doesn't cost a lot in time or money. Yeah. Like once you understand the concepts, it's just like a practice. Yeah. And I really want to go back to the idea of continuous improvement, the idea of 5% oh. better, which I later learned about Kaizen, the Japanese concept. Uh -huh. I love when I stumble across, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like an ancient concept that I'm now been talking about. So here, you know, no new thing ever decided yeah. in this world. It's just a matter of how we talk about it. So 5% better. My wife heard me say that my program was going to be called the 5% Advantage Program, this, this Zoom, yeah. you know, um, training that I was doing. And she said, who wants to get only 5% better? And yeah. I said, no, 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 5% better every, every time yeah. you speak or host. Yeah. Because it's that continuous improvement model that mm. makes you leaps and bounds better over mm -hmm. a very short period of time. Yeah. So if we just said, okay, every meeting that we have, we have this weekly meeting, we're going to try one little tweak and then yeah. see how that works. I yeah, mean, please. even if you didn't do it every meeting, even if you did it once a month, you tried a new thing for a month. I think that but it's the about whole, being like, intentional. This is how we do things. Yeah. This yeah. is how we do things. This is how we do things. This is how we do it. No, but I, no. It, like. I think, unfortunately, what we end up doing is having meetings that don't have pre-planned agendas so that the people yep. like me who don't need to know what we're talking about to speak on it benefit. I don't have a problem with that. I know what's going on. I, I don't even know yeah. what the question is. I can just start talking. But someone else who needs time to be thoughtful is quiet. And then people think they're not participating because their participation is not visible, but they right. are participating. They just so need a space think... to contribute after. Like... So your, your latest book is about Zoom meetings. But really, I uh, think ostensibly, exactly. This is my point. I think this is actually a leadership book 
if leaders are concerned right now, which they are, how do we build culture? This is the how to to build culture, which is mm -hmm. so nuanced and so thoughtful. You just pick a few of these things, you're going to start to see the difference in that creating that welcoming space. And all of a sudden, you're going to have a culture you're proud of. You know, it's funny about that. And I love this conversation we're having because it's different than all the interviews I've been doing lately. And I really appreciate that. Um, I love coming at things in a way that's a little subterfuge because if you come at people directly, mm. they're like, we don't need that. But if you can <laughs> solve a little problem that they know they have and they're willing to admit, everyone's willing to admit they don't do Zoom well because they don't expect it. They don't feel judged by that. So you don't think I should open with you're squandering talent leaders. You're squash like you don't think I should, that should be my opening. Probably Please pay not. Pay attention to what I'm saying because you've been screwing up all this time. Not yeah. intentionally. Not no, intentionally. No. But... Instead, you have to say, you know, like <laughs> something about the money they've invested in their talent program mm -hmm. not being, um, not achieving the outcomes they had desired. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, yeah, we don't really like that. And you're like, yeah, I know. Me is it that I have zero art of subterfuge. <laughs> it's like zero. <laughs> like, here, straight up. This is it. And, 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 and you say, I didn't know that specifically about you, but I've, I've heard this from a lot of organizations exactly. I've worked with. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you've had this happen too. So anyway, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, gotcha. I agree that the people who read this book are going to be learning the art of how to do mm -hmm. more thoughtful design and inclusion and all that. It's not like I'm banging them over the head to do that. Like I'm offering them a way in yeah. that is really something that they can, they can understand. I mean, Zoom became a four letter word. Yeah. If you're still using it, then you got to get better at it. Like if you've decided that this is yeah. not a part of your business model, yeah. your company's not doing virtual programming, yeah. that's your loss. You've made a decision. But if yeah. you're still doing it and you've yeah. chosen not to get better and you now know there is a possibility of getting better. What are you going to do? You kind of now think, well, let me read this. And there's enough ideas that you can DIY in the book to, to yeah. make subtle change. And then, of course, as a coach, you know, as a consultant, I'm like, I'm available, but I have to make the case that there is a bigger problem than they realize they had. Mm -hmm. Like they don't who wants to pay for my services if they don't even think they like Zoom. So they have to first get to the right. point where like Zoom's no longer the issue. It's the design question. Right. And then it's like, well, then we just got to get that. Oh, Robbie's that design guy. And he'll even produce the event for us. And he'll train our speakers to not look like they're little tiny heads on a screen. I call that shrimping. Um, so it's, it's good as a practice to help close the gap when you're creating material for your participants and your, your prospects to go from the little P. This is my second book. The little P problem to the big P problem because the yeah. thing you're trying to sell them, the solution is for the bigger problem. Yeah. That's so. right. Sidebar. 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 Robbie, you have the best sidebars. I just, I, I love that I get to see you all the time. And I'm excited that we're sharing this book in this particular context, because I think the work you're doing in the world and the, and what's in this book, I think it does dovetail together quite nicely. And, you know, I, I brought in accessibility uh, inclusion consultants to help review sections of this book. And I, you know, mentioned them for further research and, and understanding there is, there's, I feel like there's a lot of sort of tangential communities that this book could be brought into to help surface the things they're trying to do better and bring it to people's attention in a different way. That's why you're here as it's, it's, it's full of great stuff people need to know now. And uh, so I hope after you're listening, you found great value in this conversation. And I urge you to check out Robbie's books, The Croissant Versus Bagels, Small List, Big Results, and Break Out of Boredom. Um, yeah, yeah, for for not just the Zoom insights, but really how to build a, a connected culture uh, mm -hmm. that feels safe and welcoming, which is that's priceless. So, Brilliant. Robbie, one last uh, um, thought: just toss out where people can find you most easily, and uh, yeah, love this opportunity. I will tell you that I do a lot of things, and I'm a multi passionate entrepreneur, and they are all available at robbiesamuels.com. The book and the bonus content for my latest book is at breakoutaboredom.com. The bonus content is available even if you don't buy the book. It's just there for you. It includes checklists, step-by-step -step guides, 30 plus videos. There's even a little bonus thing that's not in the, I mentioned the book, but the steps are in <laughs> the bonus, a little Easter egg. So there's a lot of information. Again, 
I want everyone to elevate their Zoom because Zoom should not, not just Zoom, but virtual should be not just an option, but is often now an optimal option if only we understand how to use the platform. It's the inclusive option many times, right? If, if the number of reasons we have that are valid not to be able to make something in person, but yeah. to be included, it's to me, this, this, this. I miss some of my big yeah. event clients. That's what they've kind of come to as a realization that instead of having two events like North and Southern California, they could do one event online and get speakers from around the world. I mean, all we have to look at is New Year's Rock and Eve. Okay. That's all we need to look at. There's people in Times Square. There's people at home. Let's figure it out, right? I love that. That's it. <laughs> so. That is the grandest <laughs> hybrid like event ever. <laughs> right? And we've got chat going on Twitter. Like we've got, we got it all going on in different forms. And we've had that I mean, for Super some Bowl time. is another example of that. People are yes. there, people are watching Oscars. People are there, people I know, are watching. Right? They're You're right. We have events. all these examples of, both audiences, they're having different experiences. This is where hybrid is very confusing as a term. Yes. They're both having different experiences, but they're feeling served. They're not trying to yes. have the same experience. Exactly. And the mistake and is it's when we're trying totally to have it be fine. Equal. It's yeah. totally fine. It has to be thought through. And so if you're mm -hmm. struggling to put an event together, you want the best ideas and ways to get 5% better. Robbie is your source for all of that, all of that insight and beautiful intention. Thanks so much for this, Robbie. I appreciate having you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. You can find all of the Happy Space Podcast episodes over at happyspacepod.com. That is also where you'll find a link to our online community. Please leave a review over at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you tune in. And if you liked what you heard, please share. After all, doesn't everyone deserve a happy space?